I watched every single anime from the spring 2024 season and here are some of the best ones worth watching. Last season was surprisingly strong, with multiple really good fantasy anime, some really far romances and the absolute peak of 70 years of Japanese animation. However, this season is also really stacked with some pretty unique anime, a bunch of sequels and quite a few long-awaited remakes. Probably the most awaited anime this season is the Spice and Wolf remake, which has remained popular even though it came out over 16 years ago. Personally, I haven't watched the original, but these first two episodes were so enjoyable. It's about Lawrence, a traveling merchant, and Holo, a wise old deity who takes on the form of a woman who he found hiding inside his wheat. At first, he didn't believe that she is the wise wolf Holo, but she certainly proved him wrong. Holo wanting to leave this village, offered him to become his partner if he takes her to her northern home, which he accepted because she might bring luck, and also you just can't say no to her. Story-wise, that's literally it. It's really simple so far, yet I really enjoyed it. The focus of the anime won't be on the story, but rather on the relationship between Lawrence and Holo, which is so much fun. There's just something really nice when you have two mature characters that can talk like normal human beings without acting weird. There was literally more progress in two minutes in their relationship than in a worse season of a romance anime. In a way, it really reminds me of Free Ren because of its pacing. There also seems to be a huge focus on the passage of time, but not in a sad or negative way like in Free Ren. I also just really love the way fantasy is incorporated into the anime. The focus of it is a lot different compared to traditional fantasy, considering it revolves around a merchant's life. It's just a nice adventure anime that doesn't need a groundbreaking, overly exaggerated story to be something memorable and captivating that we won't forget. However, if you want to see something that is the exact opposite, we have Windbreaker. It seems to be a trend for the past years of a delinquent anime from a big studio, but so far, none of them have been able to execute it that well. Mappa was pretty damn close with Buchigiri, but it kinda just fall flat in aspects that really mattered outside of the animation. Like the story or the characters. However, this season we have Windbreaker, which is as straightforward as it can get. We follow Haruka, who has just started at 4 in high school, and all he wants to do is beat up strong people. Not for the sake of being a hero or wanting peace, he just wants to fight. One common element in this kind of anime is that the fight scenes look pretty good. And once again, Cloverworks did an amazing job. The fight scenes are fluid and you can really feel the impact after every hit. Everything is constantly moving and I really like that there are actual varieties in his fighting. It's not just one swing and he's done. There are punches, kicks, headbutts, dodging. It's really really cool. I also love the varieties of angles and drawing styles used, especially this POV ones where you can see a bit of his hair. The music also stands out nicely during these scenes, really elevating them. One aspect I really love is that we actually have a well detailed character for ones who wants to fight. I really like Haruka so far, he got a pretty good backstory, good reasoning behind why he acts the way he does, and also he's a tsundere. <laughs> The one thing about certain about is how it will continue, because the first episode didn't really set up anything for the future. Jellyfish Can Swim in the Night is by far my favorite anime from this season. Last year, Dogokubo became a much bigger studio thanks to the success of Oshinoko, and this time they are back with their new original anime, in collaboration with big studios like Ufotable, Shaft, Cloverworks and Trigger, and I was just blown away with how well made it is so far. From the animation, to the character design, to the directing, to the voice acting, to the story, everything was as good as it can get. They shot way above their level with this anime. It starts out with Mahiro, a high school girl who is scared of becoming a nobody when she grows up. She's scared of failing and just scared of what the future holds in general. One night, she meets a girl who defended her mural when an idol completely ruined it with her posters. Mahiro wanting to thank her stalks her and it turns out that this girl, Kano, is a huge fan of her drawings. They talk about their personal lives, their past, their fears, and their conversation gets way more serious than they expected it to be. When Mahiro realizes how similar they are, but how Kano never gave up on becoming successful, she just ran away. On the night of Halloween, they meet once again where they just straight up hijack the idol's livestream, deciding to work together. The story itself is pretty straightforward. Multiple girls come together, they form a band, but what I really love is that the writing is just so well detailed, making you completely fall in love with the characters in such a quick time. They are unique, 
they feel real, but most importantly, they feel relatable. What the anime really nailed is the current life of teenagers, not just how they act, but how they think. It's painfully aware of the current situation of this social media boom, how everyone wants to stand out, how you can't break out just by working an office job. It talks a lot about failure, the negativity surrounding it, but also the enjoyment of it, the feeling of never wanting to give up, which obviously hits really hard for me considering I'm in a similar situation to them. Just wanting to stand out in something I think I might be good at. I love the story, I love the way the characters interact and just think. It can be painfully realistic, however what I also love is just how well made this anime is. It has such a unique and chill vibe to it. The directing is absolutely amazing, there are so many unique shots that really help convey how the characters feel. If I had to guess, this is going to be the biggest anime of this season. A condition called love is quite an interesting romance to say the least. It takes a unique approach that sets it apart from traditional romance anime. The story revolves around Hotaru, a girl who has never understood the concept of love or its purpose, and Saki, an attractive guy who becomes obsessed with her simply because she lent him an umbrella. The anime quickly highlights the toxicity of Saki's obsession, as he becomes overly fixated on Hotaru, prioritizing her happiness over his own. It starts out like that, he acts weird, obsessed, it shows that people want to date him because he's hot, but for the love of god he can't stay in one because he's weird as fuck. However what I loved about the anime so far is that he quite quickly reflects on that and understands that what he's doing isn't good or normal by any mean. It seems that the focus of the anime will be on his personal growth rather than solely on romance, which has the potential to be quite compelling if executed well. Now the only thing I can't understand is why he was drawn so ugly. This angle from far away is perfectly fine, but then we get a close up. Like what is that crimson chin? Anyway, if you want to see another really good romance though, you should check out Whisper Me A Love Song. It's about Yui, I mean Himari, a first year high school student and Yukino, fuck I mean Yori, who was part of a band and a short notice to help them out. On the first day, Himari and her friend went to see a band at the opening ceremony, where she heard Yori sing for the first time and instantly fell in love with her. Being an instantly extroverted girl, she ran up to Yori after the end of the first day and instantly confessed her love, which Yori found super cute, but wasn't sure if she felt the same way. Afterward, Yori told about it with her friends and they teased her that she might be experiencing love, which she soon realized too. Wanting to reciprocate this feeling, she also confessed that she fell in love at first sight. However, they completely misunderstood each other, each thinking that the other doesn't feel the same way. Personally, I haven't watched a lot of Yuri, but this one is surprisingly fun. I really enjoy the characters, especially their personalities. They remind me a lot of Chisato and Takina from Likoreko, just a bit more emotional. So far, it's just an overall solid adaptation that delivers on all fronts that matter, making it one of the best first episodes of this season. What I really love about it is how straightforward they are with their feelings, actually saying out loud how they feel. It's really unusual to see a romance like that, but I like this change of pace. Even if the setting itself feels quite unrealistic, like no one in real life is going to confess like that, however the characters themselves are super realistic and a joy to watch. You don't feel cringy listening to them, they are not annoying by any means. I also just really love overly extroverted characters for some reason. I'm sure this is going to be one of the cutest anime of this season. Now outside of Spice and Wolf, the biggest anime has to be Kaiju number 8. Kaiju No. 8 quickly became one of the biggest manga of all time, thanks to its unique premise and compelling storytelling. It's about Kafka, a guy whose dream was to join the defense force to fight against these Godzilla-like monsters called Kaiju that have been appearing around Japan for many years. He always wanted to fight against them, but in an unfortunate turn of events, no matter how many times he tried, he completely failed to join the military. Upon giving up his dream, he started working as a sweeper, basically cleaning up the mess after the defense force. One day, an 18-year-old joined the sweepers who was really similar to Kafka. He wanted to join the defense force no matter what. As Kafka was the one that had to teach him, they quickly got a lot closer to each other, understanding why they feel a certain way, even reminding Kafka of his desire to join the military. However, as they were finishing up their job, a kaiju appeared that put both of them into the hospital, where another one appeared that forced itself inside Kafka, turning him into a humanoid monster? The first episode was a lot more fun to watch than I expected. Kafka seems to be a really good character so far, not your 
typical shonen main character. He's an actual mature person which is so nice to watch. I really liked how well this first episode set up everything around him. We understand his past, why he acts the way he does, why he works his job, how he changed as a person, what he's capable of and what he's going to do with a hint of uncertainty and mystery. I love that and I was super happy in the first 20 minutes about how he's just a normal dude. He doesn't have a superpower or anything. It felt like he will have to grind into the defense force and then this happened. I just hope he isn't going to be super OP from the start. I also really liked Reno, quite a similar character to Kafka, being really mature. I'm sure it's going to be a pleasant to watch these characters and how they will evolve. From an animation standpoint, the anime looks good. It's nothing insanely outstanding, but it definitely looks solid and it's more than good enough for me. I also just have to point out that the opening is by Youngblood and the ending is by One Republic, which doesn't make any sense, but hey, why not? Bartender is an anime I was super excited about ever since it was announced. Not because I watched the original or had any idea what the anime was about. It's more that I just always wanted to see a Bartender anime ever since I watched that parade. And in all honesty, it's really fun to watch so far. It captures the vibe I was hoping for. But that's about it. I have absolutely no idea what the story is. So far, we have a hotel that wants to hire a bartender, but nobody meets their high standards. However, one day, the hiring agents encounter a guy multiple times who seem quite clumsy and clueless, even struggling to use a phone. Then they hear the news about a newcomer in town who won a cocktail competition in Europe and is really, really skilled. Upon arriving at the place, they realize it's the same guy they met before. Then they test him multiple times, which he passes with flying colors, and that's kind of it when it comes to the story. From the start, it's obvious that the focus won't be on the story, but rather on the vibe, which is pretty captivating. Once they enter the bar, everything shifts, the colors are really inviting, the animation is fluid, and the way they make the drinks is really technical and well detailed, which I surprisingly enjoyed way too much. In the past year, fantasy anime has changed quite a lot, with a lot fewer of them being isekais and focusing less on adventuring and related themes. The Large Demon's Dilemma is a really unique and fun fantasy series. It's about Zagan, an antisocial sorcerer who decides to participate in an auction where they were selling the goods of an arch demon. He expected to find some super rare and unknown weapons, but instead he found a rare white haired elf who he completely fell in love with at first sight and spent all his money just to buy her. However, as it was already pretty obvious, he is socially inept and has no idea how to express his true feelings to her, leading to many misunderstandings between him and her. The first half of this anime was insanely boring, I genuinely thought that I wasn't going to talk about it at all, but the second half was so much fun that I just had to watch the next episode. The anime doesn't take itself seriously at all, and it's your typical anime about 18 year olds who don't know how to express their feelings, having all the usual romance tropes, just in a fantasy setting. It was surprisingly better than I expected it to be. The characters are super fun to watch, they do act like how you expect typical romance characters to act. However, it just doesn't feel cringe at all. The jokes constantly landed, which made it so much fun to watch. The idea itself that she's a slave that he bought is a bit weird, but I'm just happy that they try to overcome and throw away their part as quickly as possible. However, if you wanted to see an actual adventuring anime, you have to watch a remaster. I was really surprised by how good this anime actually is. Here, our main character, Goburo, dies a brutal death and is reincarnated as a goblin. We follow every single day of his life as he slowly but surely levels up higher and higher. The concept of the story is really simple. He fights stronger and stronger animals with other goblins, eats them and levels up. It sounds basic and boring, something we've seen a dozen times already, but I really enjoyed it. The pacing is so good, there are no slow parts, something is constantly happening. We are thrown straight into action, which I really enjoyed. I also like that it has quite a unique setting. It has all the traditional fantasy elements you would expect, but the characters, the world and the way they progress are unique. At the end of the day, it's still your traditional fantasy, so don't expect a lot from it. But it's quite fun. Now, out of all of those, the most confusing anime I watched has to be Train to the End of the World. It's about a world where they introduce 7G for the first time, but when they turned it on, it completely destroyed the earth, turning every adult into an animal and the world into whatever this is. Now, the earth looks like a post-apocalyptic world with no way to solve it. Two years later, four girls find out that their friend, who they were looking for and who also coincidentally caused the accident, was alive in Ikebukuro. So now, they embark on a journey in hope to find her. 
This is an original anime, so I really like that no one knows what's going to happen. What I found really cool is that the anime has such a unique vibe to it. It feels tragic yet not sad at all. Everyone has accepted that the world will never turn back into what it was and no one even tries to change it. It has a really happy and slice of life vibe to it, which feels kind of weird considering what happened. While those were the 10 anime that I enjoyed the most, there are many others that are really good. Like Grandpa and Grandma Turn Young Again, it's a really unique concept and a lot of fun just being about the daily life of grandpa and grandma. The characters are super fun and it's an enjoyable watch. However, it's a bit random and jumps from story to story quite quickly, which felt a bit weird. Unnamed Memory is also pretty interesting, featuring a cursed prince who climbed the tower in hope of marrying a witch. So far there is a lot of yapping in this anime, but the witch is pretty cute. We also have Girls Band Cry, which is a full-on 3D CGI anime. While I'm not a huge fan of this kind of anime, this one looks pretty good. I love how expressive the characters can be, and the story is also pretty good. While this season has a lot of really good new anime, I also have to talk about what this season is mainly about. Sequels. This season is just filled with them. After 7 years, we finally have the second season of Konosuba, which I missed so much. I was scared that it wouldn't have the same vibe as the first two seasons. But honestly for me, it's even funnier. I also love some of the extra jokes added into it that had to be left out from the movie. We also have the second part of the second season of Mushoku Tensei, which continues in a similar way to the first half, having a bit more of a slice of life vibe, which I personally really enjoy, but it does feel like it's time for a bit of a change. Everything has just been way too good, I want to see Rudy suffer again. Later on this season, we will also have the new season of Demon Slayer, which already gets a lot of complaints thanks to mostly being recap episodes from whatever aired in theaters. Similarly, the new season of My Hero Academy only starts in May, and the current new episodes are just recaps leading up to that. We also have the third season of Slime Isekai, Anos is back once again, the fifth season of Data Life, the third season of Eurocamp and about 20 more sequels. This season is absolutely stacked and there are way too many anime to watch. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more seasonal ones in the future, please like and subscribe. If you want to see a video about my favorite anime from last season, click on this video. Thank you for watching, goodbye.